Moving on, our second speaker is Sarah Sheldon from University of Alberta. Sarah is a grad student there, and she tries to convince us that decoding covert attention is not only super cool, but it's also helpful in understanding the role of alpha activity in visual perception and attention. Sarah, take it away. All righty, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, and you can hear me? Okay, so um, this is a very, 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 very early work um, that I've been doing, applying very new techniques, at least for me. Um, so I'm gonna be talking about decoding covert attention on orientation perception task from EG alpha activity. So um, just to start off with, in the very beginning, Hans Berger showed that brain um, was never entirely at rest. It's constantly, flu or fun constantly functioning at different levels of activity. One of those levels, which he um, was the first to identify, is considered alpha activity, which is this 8 to 14 hertz. Um, you can see in the bottom right, the arrow is pointing to such activity. Uh, this activity has been um, implicated in a wide range of functions, including perception and attention. However, despite almost a century of research, it's still not clear exactly how alpha oscillatory activity is related to or how um, exactly mediates perception and attention. So um, there have been many ideas over the years. Um, one of the ideas that has recently been proposed is this baseline sensory excitability model, which um, the important thing to take away from here is that the model proposes that a baseline uh, ch or change in the baseline firing rate of sensory neurons um, is um, how alpha mediates uh, sensory response. Um, and it's important to note that this means that both um, signal and noise will change, um, leading to no change in visual discrimination, but participants um, seem more likely to respond that they saw a stimulus. Um, this is in, uh, this is in relation to this. So th that is when there is no attention that is present. On the other hand, uh, when attention is present, um, rather than changing just the overall baseline firing rate, alpha selectively enhances um, relevant or suppresses irrelevant uh, sensory areas, which does lead to a net improvement in visual performance. Um, a similar a similar idea, um, not, nece not necessarily mutually exclusive, um, but uh, an another model uh, is proposed by this group uh, called the Oscillation-Based Probability Response Model. Uh, what the takeaway from here is that they propose that rather than just uh, alpha power being responsible for visual per or visual perception and attention, is really alpha power uh, that it's modulating gamma that then um, is what modulates the neural response. Um, and they propose that this can either be done by alpha modulating gamma amplitude or alpha modulating gamma phase. Now, um, to try to get at whether which of these two models might be correct. Um, first, I took data from this task called the Q orientation detection task. Uh, starts with a fixation. And then there's one of three cues that can show up. Um, a cue either pointing to the left or right that will tell the participant that the uh, target will show up on the right or left, and it's always informative. So if it's pointing to the left, it will always show up on the left. Um, on the other hand, you can have this non-informative cue, which is at the bottom, which is uh, doesn't give any information about which side the target is going to show up on. And you can see this cue is present for a variable amount of time. And then target 
flashes very briefly. Um, I haven't really come up with a good name for this target except pointy thing. Um, so the pointy thing will be pointing in uh, one of the directions. It will flash very briefly. There'll be a blank, a backwards mask, another blank period, and then response will come up where our response screen where participant can use the mouse and this uh, response pointy thing. Uh, we'll spin around and the task is for the participant to try to match um, the response pointy thing to the target pointing thing. So I have data from 34 participants, uh, all right-handed. Um, so the task is already pretty hard, but to try to get it to be about equally difficult for everyone, I use the staircasing procedure. Um, before the task, so there's a separate initial task that looks just like that task, except uh, persons should just say whether they saw it or not. And that was just meant to uh, staircase the target visibility. So it's about equal for everyone. Um, equal number of trials um, for right queue, left queue, and no info queue. And the um, pointy thing, all the target could have one of 24 um, orientations. Um, so feature extraction. So what I was really interested in when coming, uh, trying to get at the differences in these models in which uh, the data supports. Um, so I focus on this pre or on this Q period, which is before the target, um, and the try to not have it be too influenced by um, the Q onset. And um, the fact that this queue is only for a variable amount of time, um, all the epochs were aligned to the queue onset. And then the time period that I looked at was only the 200 to 1200 millisecond time period following the queue. Um, so the features that I extracted from that time period was um, the alpha power um, and the cross frequently comp Bling, um, which is the interaction between frequency bands. Um, so there's two types, one that was alpha um, am alpha amplitude, the modulates gamma amplitude, or amplitude amplitude coupling, um, which is measured using Spearman's correlation, and phase amplitude coupling, which I use the phase locking value from um, first like proposed by Cohen, or first described by Cohen in 2008. Uh, so the gray is going to be like later analysis, so you can kind of ignore that unless you're really curious, um, and I can talk about that later. But um, right now, what I've really only looked at is to try to see if I can classify uh, the trials that had no, if you, no info queue, so the ones with the queue that didn't tell them whether they're left or right, um, versus the trials that had the queued. Um, so trials that where participants were told which side was gonna be on so they could allocate attention to that side. Um, so the idea is that if this baseline, or if the evidence supports this baseline sensory excitability model, then um, the trials can be, the attention, no attention trials can be classified just with alpha power. But if this oscillation-based probability response model is more likely, then trials will be classified um, by either the amplitude-amplitude coupling or the phase-amplitude coupling. Um, so I did the uh, classification on each participant and read and ran a tenfold uh, cross-validation. Um, I use four classifiers, uh, hopefully correctly, but like I said, this is all very new, so um, I'm still learning how they work. Um, so it's it so two linear classifiers. One was linear discriminant analysis and one was SVM and then two quadratic um, classifiers, the quadratic discriminant analysis and quadratic SVM. And so like I said, these are very preliminary results and you can see there isn't really anything significant that comes out, um, but it looks like it's sort of working. Um, but like I said, I didn't actually find anything that um, any evidence that strongly supports one way or another, but like I said, this is very preliminary results and I'm 
again, need to make sure that I'm doing this all right. Uh, but I am very excited because it actually got something that um, doesn't look like a total nonsense. So like I said, there's still a lot more to do. Um, like I said, I used the Cohen's, the phase uh, locking value for the phase amplitude coupling, but there's a number of other ways to measure it um, that I was gonna look into. Also, like I said, it's like a 1000 millisecond time period that um, the measures are taken over. So um, it might be might make more sense to look at it in smaller time window chunks. Um, also, this is done by participant. Um, each, I don't think doing it across participants will really improve classification, but it would be interesting to see if there is um, something that, uh, some pattern that is, might be more easily picked up um, with more signal um, using cross participants. Um, and like I said, I'm still learning how classification works. So I'm, um, need to look into the hyperparameter optimization. And this was using all features, so like all electrodes. And um, so I didn't do any sort of like extraction of relevant features. I didn't do any PCA. So um, be interesting to take a look at that and other kinds of classification um, algorithms. So still a lot to do, and I'm very excited to see how this works, but if people have ideas or um, comments, suggestions, or I guess if you just think this is stupid, maybe don't tell me that, but um, if you have any comments or, just, or suggestions or questions, very happy to hear it. So thank hey. you for your time. Thank you, Sarah. Here's some applause from everybody in the audience. Uh, we have first question from Marisa Carrasco. Um, and Marisa, I will, I'll, I'll bring you up on stage, actually. I think I can do that um, if, if you want to um, ask the question. So how did estimation vary as a function of the Q is the question. And Marisa. So, so I mean, I'm not sure. Um, I might need clarification on that question. So what do you mean estimation varies a function of the Q as in? I understood correctly. You had a Q and then you had a response Q. And for the response Q, you said it's the thing that they have to adjust. And then yes. so that's an estimation task. So it seems that the first thing to do is just to make sure that your attention manipulation worked. So I was yes. wondering how it changes the estimation. Oh, so it does. It does work. Um, so at um, I did. I did actually present those results at a different conference uh, recently. So looking at the effects of Q, you do see less response error when there is a Q indicating that at least people attention does seem to be um, used and it does uh, correlate with alpha. So, how does it correlate with alpha? Uh, so, of course, so there's in addition to measuring the response error, there's also the response error gets fit to a model from co, uh, not from co, from luck, uh, Zing and luck, um, which is what that project, or at least that analysis was focused on initially. So um, it was shown that uh, alpha was, like I said, there's a, uh, it's a different project. So I can send you those slides if you're interested. Yeah, but it's a, it's a <laughs> that to, to interpret the neural response that you're seeing, it's important to know what the behavior was. Yes, yeah, so, so the behavior, thought. so there is a behavioral change due to the cue. I can tell you that there's definitely a behavioral did, change. Did you see differential effect of alpha, whether it was contralateral or ipsilateral to the cue? Uh, yes, yeah, so I did see those effects as well. OK, thank you. Yes. All right, so we actually are out of time, so let's